frontier. Um, and just in case you didn't get the reference, this is the last conversation we're going to have before we go to a town hall, and I called it the final frontier. Yeah, that's great. Because space. Of course. Because space. Um, so Rob, let's start. Um, I was hoping, you know, we're again starting on a little bit of a personal note, but like I've been a space fan since I was a little kid. I had a um, discovery model that I built by hand. Um, I grew up on NASA as a huge fan, um, and it was just it was like the most exciting thing. It got me into science. It got me into tech. It, it was the thing that motivated me. Um, and I've watched as I have grown into adult the, the commercialization of space. NASA doesn't have the budget to do space the way it needs to be done. It's turned into a business. Um, and I think I have mixed feelings about that. Um, but maybe just give a little history of this transition and, and, and the role of government sort of not stepping back, but maybe aside and letting private enterprise start putting up rockets. Yeah, thanks, Dan. No, I, I, I agree with you. I was one of those kids, too, back in the early 80s, right, who I've got pictures of a science fair, I think it is, that I was doing all sorts of space stuff. And I was very lucky to then end up uh, doing that as my career. So been been very uh, fortunate in that regard. But you know, when you look back at the history kind of, of where we've come from over the last 20, 25 years in the space uh, industry at large and government versus commercial, you see a couple of things. I mean, you know, if you look back early 2000s, late 90s, there was a, a large push uh, to try to get to space to provide data, provide services. Uh, during that time, but but really the supply side just wasn't there, right? The capital expenditure needed um, in order to put a satellite on orbit and do all the, the pieces and parts that go along with that uh, was just very expensive, and it was really just kind of remained the purview of governments at the time, NASA, um, uh, Department of Defense. Um, but over time, um, as technology has matured, you can imagine, I mean, we all have phones in our pockets, and 20 years ago that was unheard of. Uh, so that satellite, that technology has 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 found its way in this, in, into satellites as well, making them smaller, more effective, more capable. Um, that gets them now uh, able to get onto orbit and provide uh, uh, services and data from orbit. Um, and then you couple that with uh, innovations on the launch side, uh, reusability being one of the largest ones. Um, uh, those two things have come together now over time to really create this vibrant commercial industry. Um, you know, for data, for services, you know, uh, I like to point at GPS as an example, right, that, you know, none of our phones, none of our, you know, if you got, if you got money out of the ATM at any time, none of that works. Our financial markets don't work without timing signals that come from GPS and, and similar. So, so we've hit this inflection point right now where we really are at um, an exciting time. You know, uh, my past life was, was in the Department of Defense in the military, and we were just ready to, to, to buy commercial services kind of off the market, so to speak. So it's been great, um, and, and it really the future is bright in terms of growth in this area. Yeah, and the, I mean, as we were putting together the program, the phrase spaceport kept coming up. And I mean, spaceport seems like a sci-fi term. Um, you know, I, I understand what it sounds like, what it should be, but it's like it's being built right here and right now. Maybe you talk a little bit about how you see spaceports as a, as a transportation hub. Yeah, thanks. Uh, you know, you know at the risk of oversimplifying, really what I start to look at is spaceport is, you know, for those of you that may have flown into Orlando, it's really no different uh, conceptually as an airport. Um, the only difference being we're going, we're taking cargo or something and taking it from the ground and, and moving it up into space. Um, and that's fundamentally what it's about. And so we try to really look to normalize that model, right? Obviously the infrastructure is, is, is relatively large and you know, we used to like to say space is hard and launch is hard. I um, mean, it is, right? A, a rocket takes a million miracles to actually get something uh, into orbit. But uh, over time, uh, what we've seen is we really have to start uh, normalizing this concept of space transportation. So a spaceport just becomes a node in that network uh, overall. Uh, we're very fortunate, of course, to have one, uh, one of the world's premier locations uh, here on the east coast of Florida. But ultimately, you know, as we start to think about that, we're going to get to a point uh, where we have to consider airports, seaports, um, land, rail, what all, all the different modes of transportation are all going to be a player. And space will just be one more node in that transportation network. I think when most people think about the space travel, I think about putting people up in, 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 a, in, a, in crafts and, and then bringing them back down. Space tourism is a, trying to get started. Um, but really, the commercial applications of what is going on up there um, is, is so much larger than that. So maybe just try and give people a, a sense of the scope of what's happening unseen. Yeah, absolutely. You know, I, I mentioned data and services earlier, and, and I think that's really been the, uh, and AI actually is probably a, a big enabler of, of some of that. Um, 
you know, you can look pretty broadly at communications is this key and it's always been a, a, a focus area uh, for commercial services from Orbit and Starlink and now Kuiper and, and some of these companies, OneWeb is another, that, that are all trying to get into that market to provide ubiquitous service. Uh, I mentioned GPS and positioning and navigation and timing signals and the, and the wealth of information that comes off of that. But you can expand that too, and, and, and the US government actually made some, some very long strategic decisions to open up access to imagery and allow commercial imagery. So you have uh, all of us that look at a Google Maps or a Google Earth or something like that and see uh, pictures of the Earth from space and how much that is used on a daily basis, not to mention the data that comes off that that allows us to, to create some some interesting um, decision networks overall. So that is just gonna continue to expand. And then we consider what happens next in terms of moving into orbit, uh, in space manufacturing. Uh, we'd like to see, you know, there's gonna be um, uh, debris removal is another in, when I talk about transportation networks and the nodes that are associated with that, at some point in time, the orbit, you're gonna need a node in space, right? You're gonna need some sort of in, uh, to and from place to go. Um, in space, and what is that going to look like? Is that going to be fuel depots? Is it going to be, you know, you can think of your gas station. You're gonna, all of those same concepts that we use on the ground are going to be effective in space. The physics is going to be a little bit different, and the scale might be a little bit different. And then, you know, as you, and you, as you look beyond, you're going to look into cislunar to the moon and asteroids, and, you know, we've had all of these ideas for, for really decades in terms of what the potential is um, from a commercial perspective from a market perspective. And so, yeah, and, and, and no pun intended, but the, the world it's more than just uh, uh, here on Earth. And, uh, you talked about your previous work at the Department of Defense. That was at Space Force, um, which launched uh, a couple of years ago. Can you talk a little bit about, you know, why that needed to come into being, come to be and, and the usefulness of the program? Yeah, you know, um, Space is, a, as I mentioned, physics being a little bit different, right? And so if you look at all the military services, there's, there's a service uh, for every domain, and, and space is different. And uh, you, know, you had to treat the problem set differently overall. And so usually, and that's, and it kinda, and that's what was nice about translating back to Space Florida, because we have to think about those problems a little bit differently. As much as I try to normalize and think through how we approach those problems, um, you know, both in the Space Force and now in my role at, uh, as the CEO of Space Florida, we really want to cons consider how we uh, take advantage and build out that uh, network uh, overall with a eye to, hey, a, the space domain is different overall in terms of how we solve those problems. It seems like, um, you know, in terms of the private companies that are actually putting up rockets, um, there aren't a ton. Um, and uh, the, uh, do, do you worry, are you, how concerned are you that the industry is very consolidated and very centralized? Yeah, you know, uh, it, it, it is a tough problem. You know, I mentioned earlier, we you know, kind of quip that launch is hard, and it is. It's, you know, it, it does take kind of a thousand miracles. But I think, you know, it'll just be like any situation, you're going to have a market demand signal. And if the market is there, and I think it is slowly continues to evolve, there's going to be uh, a need uh, for multiple providers. Uh, how that shakes out over time, I think, is difficult to say right now. Um, I think there are, there are plenty of viable candidates out there. And, you know, from a from kind of a user's perspective maybe even, you know, we want to have as many of those providers be successful overall because that hopefully then drives the overall cost and, and then opens up the market even further. What are some of the changes in uh, infrastructure that needs to be built on the ground to support a spaceport? Yeah, spaceports, I mean, they're very heavy in terms of, you can imagine just the size and the scale of, of, a, of a launch vehicle or a rocket, you know. You have to be able to have, there's, there's the launch site itself, which is a lot of concrete, you know, you, different designs. Um, you know, all the commodities that come along with that fuel, it's not just, you know, uh, liquid natural gas or oxygen or um, it's also, it's nitrogen, it's helium, it's all the, all the things that a, a high-tech vehicle needs. But then on top of that, you need power, which is significant. Um, you need some sort of uh, access, just I mentioned roads, it could be rail. You need the ability to move around. You can't just use an average road, right? It has to be wide enough uh, to consider this. We have to take that all into account. And especially as we move forward and we talk about, you know, kind of the spaceport, uh, what it's gonna future holds is we, we, we'd like to, we've, I think we've made this word up actually. It's quintimodal, right? So you, you had air, rail. It was the first time I'd heard it. Yeah, I, yeah. I had, so it's air, rail, it. sea, shipping, uh, highways, and then the fifth one is space. Yeah. Right? And so those all have to work together if we're really, you know, when you start to look at the future of, of potential options for space transportation, you know, point-to-point -point cargo, 
Um, you know, Rebecca was in here earlier talking about FedEx, right? You know, there's, there's, a, there's, a, there's a model that's out there that says, okay, well, I could deliver cargo around the Earth point to point through space and do that in, I don't know, 30, 40, 50 minutes. And, and so you want to make sure that network can support those kinds of, uh, of rapid logistics, so to speak. Explain how that works. I think it's, we were talking about it on the call, and I think it may not be totally intuitive to people. Yeah, I mean, you know. It could work. Yeah, anything that, you know, it's all based on gravity, right? So anything that go up will come down eventually, depending on where it goes. Um, and so you can, you can imagine, um, you know, much like our early astronauts, went up into space for a short period of time, come back down. New Shepard does that similar today. They go up and then they come back down. It's just a very ballistic trajectory. Um, but if you, if you plan it in advance, you can, you can un, you know, figure out, hey, here's the point I want to land at. It's, you know, anytime anything comes back to Earth, it's, it's a controlled reentry. And you just do that, right? You know, uh, SpaceX, if they return a Falcon uh, first stage, right, that's a controlled return to Earth. You could very easily consider how you could turn that around and then put that somewhere else uh, around the world. And theoretically, that could be with people, too. So instead of, I mean, air travel has been an amazing boon, but it still takes a day to fly around the planet. Um, you could wind up being on the other side of the planet in hours. Yeah, conceptually, that there is no reason to think you couldn't get there. Yeah. Now, I, I won't make any bets on the time horizon mm -hmm. for any of that. Or the cost. Or the cost. Um, but yeah, eventually, that, that would make the most sense. And sometimes, maybe it's, it's, there's an intermediary, inter intermediary step where you, you go to orbit first. Maybe you have to go around a little bit and then come back down. And you know, so and somebody will, will start to flesh that out a little bit and figure out what it looks like. So what are, the, what are the technological developments that you're most excited about, that you, the companies that you're working with here in Florida or just coming down the pike? I think really what, what, I, what, I, what I like to see overall, and you know, in Space Florida, you know, we're really looking at the entire aerospace industry here, here in the state. And the growth of, of many different areas, one, one uh, that's connected, and I mentioned, you know, as you talk, to, you talk transportation networks, um, advanced air mobility is one. EV tolls uh, are, 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 I think, an interesting growth area that, mm -hmm. that we're really hoping to help uh, mature uh, because there's that connection of moving things around, you know, transportation, and then uh, unlocking, you know, the ability for people to uh, to, to, to deliver uh, whatever you might want in a, uh, either yourself or, or something. In a Do you see? Uh, we did a story a couple of months ago on EV tolls, and we we were a little. We were a little, I wouldn't say pessimistic, but we think the timelines are going to be are, you know, longer than we might think. What, what's your take on when those are going to be commercially? You know, from some of the technology I've seen, and even just there's been some recent demonstrations, I think, you know, autonomous might be the, the, the long-term future, I think. But, but I think as you start to, especially here in this area, there's, there seems to be a, a growing market and a need for that. And so I, I'm, I'm really positive on what that looks like going forward. I think, like... You know, I, I talk about this, the space industry, and it's taken 20, 25 years to get there. So I think we've got to be a real, little bit realistic about that. But that now is a time to start thinking about what are the, um, you know, what's the policy, what's the regulatory framework look like, both on, on uh, advanced air mobility and then, of course, in space, too. We, we have that keeps having that same conversation about setting the conditions now so that as these technologies mature, um, all of that is in place and it can grow faster. So in terms of like space priorities, you know, there's a, there's been many debates about what our what our priorities should be, what we should be optimizing for. Uh, we've been to the moon. Do we need to go back to the moon? Is there a reason to do that? Do we need to go to Mars? Is that the wrong goal to try and solve for? You know, what's your take on that? You're obviously in business now, so you're going to think about the business opportunities. But like, in terms of the challenge, the lift, you know, is the juice worth the squeeze? Yeah, I, I think you know. I think human nature, you know, is, is, is to progress, right? We're going to continue to progress and we're going to continue to want to move into the future. And, and I think there are opportunities out there, whether that's at Mars, whether that's lunar, whether that's an asteroid, that someone will unlock. Um, and the hard part for me is to try to figure out what that timeline looks like. Um, and I am probably not good enough on, on guessing what that timeline looks like. It, we will get there eventually, though. And I think uh, ultimately... Um, when you think about things like even in space manufacturing, the things you can do in the life sciences, the things you can do for uh, material sciences that can only happen in like a zero gravity environment, I think we will slowly start to get those out there. So I think in the long run, it's, it's net positive, yeah. um, and I'm excited to see kind of what comes out of it. Excellent. Rob, thanks so much for coming. It was a great conversation. Stick around for the town hall. I bet yeah. people have questions. All right, great. All right. Thanks.